In the first part of this seminar, uh, I introduced to you a lot of concepts such as globalization and uh, massification. I spoke about corporatization as well as McDonaldization, which resulted in APMs uh, that go into the third spaces of uh, higher educational institutions. And I also spoke about grounded theory and uh, grounded theory methodology. All of that to bring us to this point about blended EAP professionals. The second part of this uh, this talk will now focus more specifically upon the grounded theory of uh, this thesis uh, and in the context of situation I'll introduce to you bleep trajectories and typologies I'll tell you about some of the social processes of bleeps that emerged from this study and then at the end of this hour uh, I'd like us to reflect upon some critical questions. All right, let's move on. The first part of a trajectory within the bleep's life is that they usually, almost always, in my six years of study, started out as a teacher of EAP, a TEEP. And at some time in their career, they were noticed by uh, someone in administrative power at a university, so one who took the role of a type of patron. Uh, sometimes there would be people who were senior members of an academic department uh, that would do this as well, but that was actually quite rare. Nevertheless, over time, the administrative, usually the administrative or academic patron, will groom and educate and watch a certain teacher of EAP until they rose that person up to become a bleep. Now, a bleep is usually a person who was a teacher of EAP and they have now been raised in a position of managerial authority, or rather I should say managerial responsibility, but that they lack the authority or the power of a typical middle manager. And so they exist in this third space between various uh, tribes within the institution and they have to seek to survive and thrive some way without using the typical instruments of power or authority to do so. Bleeps typically have studied EAP abroad for several years. They're often multilingual, if not multicultural. If they're married, they're, they're often married to a foreign national. In the study that I conducted, almost all of the bleeps were male. They were ambitious young men, usually. There were a few females, but they had to be incredibly strong-willed to beat the men, so to speak. They were all groomed to their position, essentially to make the patron look good and to fulfill his or her agenda. I'll share with you now a typical story of about one bleep being raised up. Uh, this bleep was noticed while teaching abroad by a senior administrator from an American university who invited the teacher, at that time TEEP, over to America uh, on a scholarship to study for a master's degree. And during that time, this bleep also taught as a TEEP, teacher of EAP, with senior female TEEPs in the EA depart EAP department for years. After finishing the MA, this, uh, this young man was raised up to the position of a bleep over that of the senior female teeps. He speaks. And then, you know, someone in there that was a GA graduate assistant under the name of a teep, you know before. Mm -hmm. It was you? That was me. And, you know, you get some personal things there. And she applied for my job, and, and I won. And, you know, so I think she's got some issues, personal, just that it's the old boys club. And she mentioned that a long time ago when I was, uh, uh, when I was a GA, mm -hmm, about that, and that it was hard for her husband to get a job here because he wasn't a drinking buddy of someone or something. So she mentioned that at work, and I'm sure she feels that's how I've gotten my job, but I'm not part of any secret club that, you know, in the basement of the president's house or anything you go to, I mean. But I, you know, you know, in a personable way, personable white guys probably get their way here, especially if they've got personal connections, you know. 
Another aspect of the bleep typology and trajectory is that they all experience a very sense of a, a strong sense of ambiguity with regard to their identity. If one goes into a corporatizing higher educational institution and you ask a person, what's your job, what's your role, one who's in administrative management will say very clearly and immediately, I'm an administrator, or I'm a manager, or I'll say, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I'm a teacher, or one will say, I, I'm a teacher of English. But for the person who is a blended EAP professional, that identity is definitely uh, an issue for them. Here is one example of an interview. The end of the informant says, well, I play a key part in things, but I am status-wise and someone who is put in the corner. I'm like a ghost, really, and I would just like to be a teacher, academic. I'm tired of the politics. What are you now? Administrator? Teacher? Both? Yes, I would say teacher, administrative researcher, and politician. Salesman, too. You're an entrepreneur for the school, then? Yes, that would be a good term. Part of it. Invest in me and I'll turn a profit for you? Yes. That is how things are done with administrators. Deals. You say you were saying you felt like a ghost. Being a ghost is a lonely experience, I would think. You are isolated, but you have a certain amount of freedom. The court jester. The court jester, an interesting term. How can an entrepreneurial player who is a salesman for the university, a politician, and researcher also be a jester? In the craziness of things, my comments reveal a clearer picture than Japanese can't uh, admit or say. You call things the way you see them and people think it is offensive or just untrue, but actually you see that it brings some change. But Greg, as you can see from all my metaphors, I really don't know what I am. Moving from there, let me talk to you a little bit more specifically about a typology. I found three that uh, emerged in my, in my study. That of the sinking bleep, the transactional bleep, and the upwardly mobile bleep. And uh, apart from this being something of a, maybe a hot, or a cold, medium, and hot, or just simply three types, I have to say that these are very general uh, types that the people that I interviewed sometimes would slide in between these, or you could actually see this perhaps better as a climb. There are people who would be, shall we say, between sinking and transactional, or between transactional and upwardly mobile. So these are very general uh, types that I would like to present to you to give you an idea of, of the types of bleeps that I saw uh, emerge over time and time again in my study. All right, let's look at them in greater detail. The seeking bleep is oftentimes a very, very dynamic teacher of EAP. And in fact, this was the reason why he or she had been raised up to be a bleep in the first place. Their talent, their drive, uh, the way that they could inspire students and other teachers around them would catch the eye of a university patron. However, the thing is, is that they are a teacher and they're really not equipped and it's really not their desire to be a bleep. Oftentimes it's the, the lure of a little bit extra money or the possibility of greater stability in their job that, um, that tempts them to take these types of positions. In all of my interviews, the sinking bleeps viewed the corporate university as a threat, a threat against culture of education, a threat against society, a threat against the identity of teachers. They often looked at, at administrative management as incompetent and they would side with the desires of teachers and students and in a sense would create and create organizational bunkers within which they would hide and stay within to try to protect the teachers and students from any outside touching or interference as they saw it from the administrative management. One thing that I found that was common to most if not all is that when you spoke with them on a deeper level this sinking bleep often admired 
and was influenced by and espoused the professional values that they received from usually a retired colleague, an older teacher or mentor who had made a, a deep impression on that person and they were doing their best to emulate uh, that model in their life. The problem is, is that those professional values and beliefs were often at odds with the values and beliefs and agendas of the people in the administrative management of a corporatizing university. They used many of the social processes and strategies that we'll look at later in this talk, but they used them in a very obvious and politically, uh, shall we say, clumsy way. And over time, because they would constantly made uh, fools of themselves unwittingly, they would lose the patronage of their, the person in, in administration or sometimes in an academic wing who had brought them up into this post. Because over time, the sinking bleep makes the patron look bad in front of other people that he or she is trying to impress in the hierarchy of the university. Let me give you a few examples of some of the type of discourse, uh, interview discourse, that came from sinking bleeps. I don't think that many very I don't think that very many senior managers are good at receiving things from below. It never ceases to amaze me how stupid and bureaucratic some of them are. What do they take it as a challenge to their authority if someone gives them? Well, I don't think that would be the case at Winsleydale. I, I just think that. Well, putting it bluntly, I think there's one thing in managers which I don't know what the training or educational solution actually is, and that is wisdom. A lot of them are not very wise. Wisdom for me would be if I had, on the precessional course, somebody had said, I've written a report here on the class. I've analyzed their work and their data, and I think this is a re reasonable judgment, an evidence-based judgment about what I think they're achieving. Here's a list of things that I intend to do and to try and improve the effectiveness of my teaching. Here are some things that I think would help if the management team were to put them into the course or facilitate this, that, and the other. I mean, nobody's ever done that to me, but if they did, I would be absolutely delighted. I would think, Christ, that's amazing. Just what you want, really. You want people formatively evaluating themselves, being critical, reflective practitioners. Absolutely ace. Why would management take offense or exception, at least, to that sort of approach, which is the impression I'm getting from you, that they wouldn't be able to accept a teacher doing that sort of thing? Why? What's important to them is being in charge and being in control. And within a bureaucratic organization policy, everything's decided at the top and handed down to the subordinates. So any autonomous action on the part of the subordinate is regarded as subversive. Well, that's a stupid way to think, you know. If the whole thing is about teaching and learning, then anything which is about the teaching and learning process, or anything which is likely to enhance that progress, has got to be something that you are only too glad to see. Moving on to the transactional bleep. In, in my study, most of them were typically talented academics. They had often published widely at some time in their career. They were very interesting in that they often looked at the corporate university as a game, something that had to be played, something that had to be flipped and moved around. And, and in, within the ambiguity of the third space, they often thrived. A person by the name of Hyde back in 1998 uh, wrote a book called Trickster Makes This World. It's called Trickster Theory, and I think that if you'd like to get a short summary of what it means, you can go to TED. TED.com, and uh, someone gives a, a talk on it called Trickster Makes This World, I believe. Anyway, that's just as a, as a short summary. I don't like the term trickster, actually, because it, it, tems, it tends to uh, denote uh, a con man or something criminal or, or, or uh, maybe a manipulative element within it. But tr uh, trickster theory pulls upon the old metaphors of mythologies, the old god mythologies, where one had the messenger god that would move between the gods and the people. Uh, the, you know, for example, Mercury, who would who would bring messages back and forth between, or Loki in in the uh, myths of uh, the Native Americans. Uh, uh, other, uh, others such as these, 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 these 
these tricksters, that in the presence of the gods or the other pantheon, they often appear to be something of a court jester, really, way. so slightly humorous, but very useful. And to the humans, they seem to be slightly suspicious, but also very useful. And so in this position of being a consummate go-between, they often have something on the side that is really feeding them. Uh, they, they are often people of great appetites, and uh, it could be for them that they have the opportunity to travel a lot in their post or to uh, uh, meet a lot of people or to go to conferences. or Well, there's always something that's usually outside the workplace that really drives these people to stay in the third space. And although sometimes they think that they're rather clever in the way that they have maintained this, uh, living in a sense like an octopus flitting back and forth and using their camouflage, while they themselves being nothing more than bait to many predators, and while they think that their, their camouflage is working well, usually TEEPs and administrative management know what the transactional bleep is about, and they allow them to have their little thing that they like to do because they are so useful. They tend to protect teachers and students as well, but the, what they do is they tend to bargain for space, and they tend to slow down the processes of, of uh, administrative management and allow teachers and students' time to become uh, adjusted to the climate changes that are coming down. But they will uh, certainly do their best to stop administrative uh, initiatives if they feel, if the tr transactional belief feels that their own third space comfort will be threatened by that. These are very, very politically astute and innovative people. They're imaginative. They do a lot of things for their uh, university in these EAP third spaces. And as a result, they're typically valued by university patrons. And more often than not, they're, they're liked, if not entirely trusted, by the teachers of EAP. Let me give you a, a couple of examples from the interview data that uh, touches upon some of these points. This uh, transactional bleep says, I know it needs to be done, and I feel that I can deliver with the right support, but you're also gambling and hedging. A player. I am a player. You may say stakeholder, but in the game of reform, you are a player. You want to change things so you need at times to, to at times disrupt and bluff and gamble. Okay, give me this much money and the classes to do this, and I will deliver this. Another transactional bleep talks. This one was teaching uh, uh, EAP teachers that, uh, that he referred to as academics. What then would be the key principle that guides your management style? I think, I think really support. I think making sure that staff particularly have all the support I can give them. And I think that's really important. Support and development, really. I think that's a key thing about it, I think. And protection. Protection in the sense uh, to this, is, this, year, this year in between university and the teachers. And I think protecting the staff from too much interference from admin and sorting out the problems before they actually get to staff, in a sense. I think that's very important. And also presenting a view to the administration on a reorganization of staff because there are people in the university that still don't really know what we do. And that's actually very important. Going back to this protection thing is you've got a group there of fairly individualistic people. I think university academics are a fairly individualistic crowd. They've all got huge talents, they've got huge energy, huge motivation, and you've got to preserve it. And it's very easy to destroy that. If you can't let them, you just really have got to let them create opportunities and let them develop and develop those opportunities as much as you can within administrative and financial constraints and things like that. But you actually can't start certainly with our unit. I think it's general with most of the certain, uh, certain, most of the certainly humanities departments. You can't actually start telling people what to do. Basically, you suggest and so on. But ultimately, the ideas have got to come bottom up and you've got to encourage that as much as you can. Moving on to the upwardly mobile bleep, most of these had a background in business before they became a teacher of EAP. 
they found over time that even though they at earlier in their in their their trajectory they felt that they couldn't make it in the business world over time they became more and more dissatisfied with being a teacher of EAP and so when their university began to corporatize they began to see the corporate university as an opportunity they knew the rules implicitly they knew what would, what it was about and they knew which direction they needed to go and it was not down and it was not sideways it was up away from the instability of the uh, third space. They often viewed the teachers of EAP, their TEEPs, as problematic, as, as, a, as an element that needed to be managed and dealt with and controlled, and that their issues needed to be kept away as much as possible from the prying years of administrative management. They typically discussed their students as knowledge consumers in some sort of way. And they were often very aggressive in implementing the administrative plans. It would be surprising, you would think that these upwardly mobile bleeps would be successful, but they were actually quite politically fraught. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this when I touch upon the trajectory. but. If the teachers of EAP were uh, became aware of the upwardly mobile aspirations of the bleep, they could and often did work very hard in a silent way to undermine and to undercut the the plans of the bleep and to make him or her look unsuccessful to the uh, to the administrative uh, patrons. If the bleep was seen to be very ambitious to the patrons within the, the, the university, that also kept them from, uh, from, from reaching their aspirations. If they were too aggressive in the administration of administrative plans, this was also very damaging for a number of reasons. One, patrons did not want to bring someone into their, into their level of the university who would eventually become a rival and might threaten their power. And there was another aspect that I can describe metaphorically in that the upwardly mobile bleep could be seen in a way like a type of guard dog. And a guard dog is very useful on the periphery, but you don't want a guard dog at the table with you when you're having dinner with your family. Let's look at some examples of uh, upwardly mobile bleep discourse in interviews. As I said, f for English education in general, the administrators don't have somebody who they can use. And I am also seen as a black ship, like in the Meiji Restoration, even with the Bakufu. Many welcomed the foreign ships as they would shake things up. So, you are a black ship, and the Bakufu welcomes you because you can shake up the university system and make it more progressive and quality-based, huh? Yes, for sure. The higher it goes up, the more they like me. Who do you represent, then? the new merchant class that is trying to get rid of the old culture-based samurai class? Yeah, that would be kind of like that. If we don't change, we will disappear. We, meaning the university? Yeah, things have declined, and the uni, like the Bakufu, can no longer sustain itself in the current trajectory. Not just the uni, the Gakuen. English education is critical. It's down to money, then. Yeah. For sure. Money, survival. Lack of money means the system must be changed. Value for money and all that, huh? Yeah. Loss of money is fueling the change for sure. They never prepared for these days. Again, all of these bleeps are, in the beginning, working within the center of praxis, this third space where EAPs, where EAP units are located. Now, their trajectories often go in one of uh, two directions, uh, up or down in the institution. For the upwardly mobile bleep, if they're successful in the social processes that will be uh, introduced in just a few moments, then they, then they do uh, end up leaving uh, the area of uh, EAP and they, they move into a senior uh, administrative position. I've seen some who have become vice chancellors of small Japanese universities, I've seen some who have moved up into uh, chairs of certain departments uh, where they've moved, they've moved out of EAP and they've moved into another, uh, actually either administrative or sometimes, very sometimes, uh, an academic, uh, a, a tenured 
uh, long-term academic post, but upwardly mobile bleeps oftentimes in their upward trajectory to get out of this third space usually don't get it right the first two or three times. So once they've been discovered to be very, very ambitious and aspirational, they often have to move to one, two, three different universities uh, until the, they've developed the strategies necessary to hide their ambition and to move into the position uh, uh, to, to um, uh, move into the positions that they they crave. Transactional bleeps often stay within the center uh, of praxis, within the third space, for quite a long time because they 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 like the ambiguity. They're able to flow in and out of it, to profit off of it, to enjoy the the interactions that they have. They they are again, as I say, the consummate middlemen. But uh, the the transactional bleeps are ones who as I said earlier, very they're, they're, they're creatures of appetite. And in, in my study for over six years, the transactional bleeps who, who either uh, who, who didn't stay, who, who, whose trajectory in the middle changed, it was related oftentimes to uh, wine, uh, women and song, or discomfort. What I mean is, a, it could have. It's it, there were cases of either alcoholism, or uh, sexual scandal, or a song. In this sense, would be uh, enjoyment outside of uh, the actual workplace. Uh, too much time outside the office, traveling here or there, going to this conference or that conference, um, uh, or pain. Meaning, if, for example, uh, something. Uh, something were to happen in the uh, amongst the teachers of EAP or the students, and the dissent became such that the transactional bleep could no longer control it or keep it away from the ears of the uh, administrative patrons. Then, if the, for that that downward pressure would typically push them up to becoming upwardly mobile, whereas if they had fallen into uh, their appetites to the point that it affected their work, they would be they would then enter into the sinking bleep trajectory. The sinking bleeps were rarely sacked outright. Um, what normally happened to them is that the administrative patron would put another layer or even two more layers of administrative management over the uh, sinking bleep, which would keep him or her from having the access to the patron anymore and effectively would be demoting them. Uh, without actually uh, causing them to lose their lose the, the 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 post the name of their post, but they would be effectively demoted. And in that case, the teeps uh, and sometimes the students in the unit, while before they may have liked the sinking bleep, supporting their their views and supporting their agenda, people for some reason don't. They, they can't suffer a, a loser. And when a person loses that access to the uh, people above, they were often quite cruel to them and, and very disrespectful of them time and time again. It was a very scary dynamic that I saw. And if, once a person becomes a bleep, if they stay in that university, they'll never be accepted by the teachers of EAP as one of them ever again. And so the sinking bleep stayed in a, in a position that was uh, highly isolated if and their only option usually was to leave and go to another university or to completely reboot their career where that they would no longer in any way shape or form refer to any of their past successes because that would also be linked to their past failures and completely reinvent themselves this took a lot of energy and a lot of time Let's move on now to some of the social processes that uh, emerged from my study. The top three main social processes for bleeps in corporatizing universities were hunting and gathering, weighing and measuring, and molding and shaping. Let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail. What's the main issue? What's the main problem that plagues the program in your view? If you don't want to use a negative word like problem, no, no, that's fine. What's the main challenge? 
I would say getting enough students interested to come and to be a part of the program so that the program has a life of its own and there's a different dynamic when you've got a dozen students to when you have seven or eighteen when you have nine or something. And as you know, some of those things you can articulate and some of those things, some of, some of those are just the feel and things. And you're able to do things and your experiences are greater when you have a larger number. And it's better for Polaris. I think it's probably better for Nugis. So I see the number one problem. I guess we'd call it recruitment and employment. Hunting and gathering is very a uh, very complex social process, and I'm only going to be able to speak on a on very simple simple terms. But we have to understand that the outside issues that some of which I discussed earlier uh, in the first part of the seminar is that the people of a country elect governments that cut uh, monetary support to higher education and try to make it more and more uh, independent to operate more and more like a business. And so this, these contribute uh, to corporatization. This is what causes the decrease in public support. And these are the types of contextual factors that end up uh, making an EAP unit within a corporatizing university uh, as, uh, some, as an organism that is always on the verge of starvation. And in fact, uh, what, I, what I found time and time again in corporatizing uh, HEIs is that the upper level administration would not allow EAP units to keep a, a surplus of any monies that they made. Uh, money is power. And uh, they, it was, it was, it's important to the institution that no third space unit has amassed uh, its own its own ability to hold off a siege, so to speak. Now, there are a lot of things that go into hunting and gathering, and it depends many times upon the uh, the needs of the university. Now, certainly, this this means oftentimes that the bleep is in charge of recruitment of students, and that he or she is constantly out looking for uh, and uh, trying to bring in students, either personally or by finding uh, recruitment agencies. Um, bringing in students and large numbers of them shows demonstrates great value to the uh, institution. In Japan, though, it's not only uh, the hunting and gathering of students. In in the Japanese universities that I that I studied, bleeps often spend as much, if not more, time hunting and gathering teachers for EAP. Because the teacher for e teacher of EAP in a Japanese university, especially the small private ones, uh, serve the purpose of the international student. That, at least in the eyes of administration, uh, that international students often uh, they fulfill the role that international students often uh, have in American and British universities. Administration often sees a minute, sees the international student not simply as bringing money, because that that once they've brought a certain amount of money, then that's it. That that value doesn't really go any further than that. And it's in many kind of places, such as the UK now, the uh, the domestic students are bringing in as much money as the international students. Uh, what the administrative management often look for are that uh, overseas students will be a type of living curriculum to the domestic students to provide. Uh, international experiences uh, to open up their minds to the world so that the domestic students will be able to uh, interact with and to participate more in the global economy. Uh, in Japan, the international teacher, the the foreign teacher of English uh, as a foreign language, serves that purpose. Uh, they're very valuable because they're stable. They don't have as many problems uh, as a um, an international student might have in terms of adjustment. They actually fulfill a, a role in bringing in money for the uh, university by being a te by being uh, one the students will want to study with that person and such. At any rate, the bleep will spend a lot of time uh, interacting with other bleeps and uh, maintaining uh, networks to try to find the teeps that will make the uh, university uh, and the bleep look good. 
Down below, there are other uh, strategies and properties that go into hunting and gathering. And uh, these are, again, all theoretical terms that I have developed. Investment servicing is the uh, work that a bleep goes in, that a, a bleep engage, engages in, in cultivating uh, and, and doing things for people uh, or for institutions or for organizations that will bring later on uh, people or students to the institution. They may help someone or help students or do things for students or for other teachers which will uh, in turn over time lead to a good reputation of, to, of the bleep and the uh, university which those through those referrals they will actually uh, gather in more people. Resource prospecting is actual uh, well we, what a salesperson would call is cultivation. You go, you 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 meet people, you go to places, you you attend uh, conferences, you go to all of the different places that you can, where you you can begin to spread your influence and to make the contacts, to maintain them, and then these will become the means by which you can bring in in various resources for the EAP unit people, sometimes it can be uh, uh, programs that will be seen as innovative, all sorts of things. Resource leaching is something that also is, this, this would relate to internal hunting and gathering. The, this is where uh, uh, the bleep has been given uh, an initiative from uh, the administrative command and control to do something or to to create something but the bleep doesn't have usually doesn't have a budget and doesn't have control over lots of funds and doesn't also doesn't have the managerial power to order teeps or other people to do it so the bleep has to find a way to get other people to help fulfill uh, certain initiatives essentially for free. Resource leaching is a way to bring in students, sometimes people from the community, to in the name of educational experiences or service learning or other other sorts of uh, uh, tags to do something that is actually on behalf of the EAP unit or for the bleep uh, and uh, to get certain jobs done and th the people that are leached in this way will usually get uh, either uh, an award or at least a feeling of belonging to something bigger than, than themselves. Their, their isolation, their loneliness is often assuaged. Uh, cash cow milking relates to the, the dynamic within corporatizing universities that have uh, number, many, many different vendors that have businesses set up on the university and, and also administrative uh, fees and charges as well to, to, uh, to gather extra money from uh, domestic students. Uh, international students typically uh, will be charged for things that they, they, they don't need and they, they can't use or, or are unable to access but be, because of administrative processes they are often typically um, forced to, uh, to, to, to do these things. TEEPs oftentimes will come in as advocates to try to protect the international students from this type of milking and the bleeps who are successful in, in cash cow milking realize that if they get between the different vendors and their their income streams it'll be very dangerous for the bleeps career so the bleep will often spend a lot of time keeping the teeps from uh, from informing or from ad being an advocate on behalf of the students uh, to in order to allow the university to collect those extra funds over time from the uh, students and I could go into greater detail this is a very very simple uh, this, this, there's, there's, there are all sorts of strategies and contingencies that that are under uh, all of these uh, these different for investment servicing, resource prospecting, uh, leaching, and milking. I, I could spend an hour talking just about this, but uh, let's move on to the next process. The culture here has changed to, to a much stronger business model. Yeah, it, it's yeah. I mean. Uh, the quality, the quality systems approach is basically a very firm business model. For administration, from our point of view, it tends to be uh, very, uh, very business oriented. 
You plan, you forecast, and measure, and evaluate, and, and re reset for goals, and you, you follow this process, and you try to bring in this second loop of learning, and then go out and benchmark and see if you're doing everything right. I think that's a trend. And going towards the, you know, something that you need to make sure that you're efficient and effective, and you get the most bang for the buck, and everything's measured another interview. I think trust is the most important thing. I think that underlines just about anything you do in life and I think that you would give someone a job before and you'd say this is your job go and do it and you'd trust them to do it. And there wouldn't need to be official paper controls on whether they've done it. You wouldn't need to have appraisal systems to see whether they've done it. You trusted them. Now, okay, some people would abuse the system and so you'd get some people not performing up to standard and you would have to do something about that. But now, because this trust is gone, it's all back to numbers and measurement. Now, depending on the country and in sometimes in some in some cases the the local the local factors, uh, there'll be external issues that will be part and internal factors that will be, be part of the contextual factors that contribute to weighing and measuring. For example, the UK has a lot of external uh, organizations connected to the government that uh, re is usually is called um, assessment as such. Um, and of course, within the uh, universities, uh, the corporatizing universities, they're constantly looking for ways to to show that they are, are being innovative, that they are satisfying uh, learners, that they're doing this and another, th another thing for their own. And then this actually will, I'll show, as I'll show later, plugs in to weighing and measuring uh, uh, to uh, uh, hunting and gathering later on. But at any rate, there are many different factors that will go into weighing and measuring. Now, Assessment is not, I would say measuring would be assessment, but inside a corporatizing university, there's the assessment uh, processes and assessment mechanisms, but there's also the unofficial weighing that goes on, things that uh, the, the, um, the administrative patrons or the academic patrons in their heart by their by their own personal standards of what's right and what's not right, what's successful and what's not, uh, what's unsuccessful. There's a lot of weighing that goes on day in and day out, and the bleep is very, very much aware of this. Now, the bleep will typically try his or her best to manage the process of, of measuring, of assessment. Uh, I have noticed in many cases, if they can, they will do their best to to control the assessment, the weighing and assessment of the program, the teachers, and the students, until they have data that they can present to their patrons that will be uh, very positive. Uh, if possible, they try to hide uh, any negative assessments, any, and they try to reshape any negative weighing that they sense that might be going on uh, and keep this out of the limelight as long as possible. Now, Another interesting thing is that if they can do it, and some of them could and some of them couldn't, but most of the bleeps would work very very hard to keep themselves out of any form of, 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 of assessment or weighing. They, if they could, would try to emulate something of what went on with the administrative patrons. See, most of the administrators assessed, they weighed, but they themselves were not held as accountable as the students and the teachers. Bleeps tried to create spaces for themselves wherein they could do the same thing. Some of them were successful and some of them weren't, but that was something that they all aspired to. Again, this is much more complex uh, a feature than a, a, a social process that I'm, I'm uh, able to speak of now. And within program assessment and teacher assessment, student assessment, uh, there were all sorts of interesting strategies uh, that bleeps uh, would use. But uh, we need to, again, again, that we should move on. I enjoy working with the students as a teacher not as an administrator and one who's always laying down the rules, but 
Where greater impact occurs is when I can make strategic decisions. And so that puts me in the administrator role. And if I'm going to be in administration, I'd rather be in a place, and this doesn't sound very good at all, but I'd rather be in a place that I can mold and shape from on high. Molding and shaping is a very, very important uh, social process that takes on in the corporatized that takes takes place in the corporatizing university, and you can see here that weighing and measuring uh, typically supports this in in many ways. By weighing and measuring, by the the assessments and by the the informal uh, uh, judging that goes on, this oftentimes gives the upper level administrators and the bleep as well the ability to, as they often say, to see the big picture, to see things beyond what students and teeps see, and to have a bigger understanding of what's really going on out there. Weighing and measuring also allows a person to maintain control. By assessing, they can also assess what's right and what's wrong, and by highlighting what's wrong by using empirical data, this empowers them to move to the next stage, which is to change something, or to, as they often will talk about, make some sort of innovative impact, something that will be that will catch the eyes of others. And innovative impacts oftentimes will will be a help to bring in uh, money and other resources, which will feed into uh, the lines not drawn there, but will feed into um, uh, hunting and gathering. Molding and shaping is all about changing the culture, changing the way people think, changing the way people do things, to, to fit the EAP unit, the TEEPs, and the students into the new world view. Not one that's focused upon different cultures and such, but one that's focused upon a global marketplace, one that's focused upon transcending borders in order to enrich lives. Of course, that may have a very, that may have a neoliberal meaning for many of the people uh, that 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 operate from this worldview. Molding and shaping has a lot of interesting dynamics that I can't get into right now. But during this whole process of of being changed culturally, and 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 the the attempts to to reshape the values and the roles of of teeps in. In, in the units of moving them away from, from shall we say, cultural artisans with a small groups of, of, um, of, of apprentices, students in their workshops to moving them more towards the automated pedagogic machine model where they are, they are uh, in something of a factory and they are controlling the process of bringing students through or they they may be service technicians where they fix broken language and they have to uh, the broken language of the students and they have to document everything that they've done so that whenever they send that unit that is the student out to the university if they get a complaint then they can through uh, uh, processivity uh, show all the processes that they that they that they went through to to make this unit and uh, therefore they can be justified in what they do all of these types of things will will take place in the reshaping of the professional identity of the team by by engaging in molding and shaping the EAP unit becomes even more reliant upon the administrative patrons uh, because they're the ones who are controlling the weighing and the measuring and they're the ones that see the big picture now ironically this does not mean that EAP is in an unstable position. Certainly the TEEPs are in an unstable position, but the EAP unit, so long as it's connected to managerial power in a corporatizing university, will endure. And in fact, something that I should say is that the third space in corporatizing universities, it's a growing space. And it, I think over the next 10 to 15 years, what we see is the traditional, uh, in these traditional uh, units and departments they will be pushed to the periphery and they will become the third space and the third space will become the main space. That means that over time with this 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 constant process of changing the way people think and the way, way that EAP teachers do things they become augmented which is another term for being changed and they become bleepified meaning that they become unified in many ways with the identity and the practices of bleeps. They begin to emulate them. And you may find upwardly mobile teeps 
transactional TEEPs and syncing TEEPs as well. Moving on now. These dynamics, as I have tried to say, are interconnected. And they, they move. They're, they're affected by what's happening outside the university. And they're affected, they're affected also by what happens inside the corporatizing university. But the core of this for, for bleeps is that they're no longer focused upon teaching. Certainly, some of them have to teach a few classes. They may still have to teach as many classes as uh, the other teeps. But the, but the core process that, that drives them now is that of struggling to manage and lead. And again, I have to say that this struggling to manage to lead, it pumps and, 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 and continues to drive below these other social processes and hunting and gathering feeds into weighing and measuring molding and shaping feeds into hunting and gathering and this is a constant ongoing dynamic process now the bleeps oftentimes because they're struggling to manage it and lead underlying that in many of my interviews was that they were often quite afraid because of the instability of their post and that fear drives them into different trajectories for those who are upwardly mobile, because they're afraid of the instability of the third space, they want to get out of it, and they'll do anything they can. Oftentimes, though, in their trajectory, they end up managing the struggle of the third space, but failing to lead, because oftentimes the teeps and the, uh, the administrative patrons are a bit afraid of them and they have, a, they have a hard time with it. They, they get the job done, but they lose hearts and souls in the process. For the transactionals, they, they are also uh, uh, afraid of, of what could happen to them if things got one way or another, and so they don't want to lose that comfort that they, that they currently uh, enjoy in the third space. So oftentimes they talk about teachers are leading teachers is like herding cats and so I, I, I'm letting them do what they need to do. They know that they can't control the situation and so they give people permission to do what they have already really wanted to do anyway. And so they end up leading others to succeed in managing the struggle. Those who are sinking bleeps again are great teachers, usually good people in the wrong type of position. And for them, it ends up being a case of failing to manage and struggling to lead. Now, in terms of a critical grounded theory, I, up to this point, I've simply tried to discuss, although certainly my own, my own uh, biases have come through from time to time, but to try to discuss uh, the processes that I observed over the years and, and in my interviews and, and, and observations. Now it's time for us to think about some questions. And these are, again, based upon uh, Ben Flugberg's uh, uh, fren frenetic uh, thinking, frenetic research cycle. He's over at uh, St. Anne's College uh, at Oxford. and he's, he's a remarkable academic, and I recommend reading his work. He would ask these questions. Uh, these questions are based on his. I've changed them a little bit. But since I'm speaking primarily in this seminar to teachers of EAP, these are the questions that I would like you to think about. In terms of your role and your post in the corporatizing EAP, uh, corporatizing university, where are we going? And who gains and who loses in this corporatizing university? And by which mechanisms of power? And I've tried to highlight some of those in, in, in the social processes. Is what is going on desirable? And here's an important question that I need to ask teachers of EAP. What are we doing to maintain the system? And how are we gaining? How are we losing? And what mechanisms of power are we using? Where are we going in this? And then what, if anything, should we, should we do about it? And one of the things that I think is... Uh, important for this and, and with this grounded theory is that first of all it raises your consciousness to some of the things that are going on in a corporatized uh, uh, environment in the in the higher education 
Certainly a lot of what I've discussed is old hat in the typical company down the street. But I think that this grounded theory highlights the degree to which higher education it has become more and more like a business. And I, I, I challenge teachers for EAP to control their anger. I don't want this to be a message from an apostle of hate. Many of us entered into higher education because we didn't want to be in a business. We didn't want to be in that environment. We didn't want to live by those values. And yet now those values have pursued us into this space. All right, what should we do about it? We do know from history that uh, simply becoming Luddites or raising up with our hammers and smashing the machinery of whatever it is that is threatening our roles never works. How can we take the values that are timeless, transcend the issues that are corrosive in our environments, and move forward? That's something that we need to think about. Another thing that I think this grounded theory can do is that it, is that it provides you with a vocabulary by which to describe things that are going on. Uh, if I am able to get this, this grounded theory published in book form, you'll be able to read it in greater detail and look at some of the other processes that are going on. But then by having common words that you can use, common theoretical labels that you can use to describe what's going on, you're able then to connect up with other people in other EAP units and continue to have greater communication. One of the things I think that has made Oxford a great place is that teachers are able to communicate with each other in common places and common spaces. That's not the, the, the case in corporatizing universities where teachers of EAP are purposely separated and individualized and made to feel weak as an individual. By joining together, by talking together, by controlling the anger and, and moving forward positively, I think these are the, some of the critical issues and critical dispositions that people need as they move further on in their careers in the 21st century. Thank you, and I'll be willing now to entertain some questions.